What if I told you that the people who pick your food often can't afford to buy it? How is that possible in one of the wealthiest countries in the world? Today, we'll explore this paradox, examining the system of farm labor that undergirds the food system in the United States. The roots of the current farm labor system are closely intertwined with exploitation and racial injustice. In the pre-revolution northern colonies, indentured servitude was widespread. Indeed, it's estimated that between half and two-thirds of all white immigrants to the colonies, numbering well into the hundreds of thousands, arrived as indentured servants, with the majority of such servants arriving from England, Ireland, Scotland, Germany, and other European countries. Under the system of indentured servitude, which was widely practiced in the Chesapeake colonies of Virginia and Maryland, Individuals would contract to work for a specified period of time, usually between four and seven years, in exchange for passage to the New World, room, board, and sometimes a small payment or plot of land upon completion of their contract. Indentured servants were employed in a variety of occupations, but the majority worked in agriculture, cultivating crops like tobacco, rice, and indigo. Life for indentured servants was harsh and often characterized by long hours of hard labor, strict discipline, and limited personal freedom. Their contracts were legally binding, and they could be bought or sold by their masters. However, they were not considered property in the same way enslaved people were, and had some legal protection, such as the right to sue their masters for mistreatment. Indentured servitude played a significant role in the development of the American colonies, providing a much-needed workforce for the growing economy. But by the late 17th century, the system began to decline as the supply of European laborers decreased and demand for enslaved peoples from Africa increased. By the mid-18th century, slavery had largely replaced indentured servitude as the primary source of labor, especially in the southern colonies. Chattel slavery was a system of enslavement practiced in the United States before the Civil War, where enslaved individuals were considered legal property or chattel, and could be bought, sold, and inherited. Between 12 and 12 and a half million Africans were forcibly transported to the Americas as slaves between the 16th and 19th century in the so-called Triangle Trade, with more than 645,000 brought to the United States. By 1860, the enslaved population in the United States had grown to nearly 4 million people, representing about 13% of the total U.S. population at the time. Enslaved people were forced to work in various sectors of the economy, but the vast majority were employed in agriculture, particularly on large plantations in the South that cultivated labor-intensive crops like cotton, tobacco, rice, and sugar. Others worked as domestic servants, artisans, or laborers in other industries. Life for enslaved people was characterized by extreme hardship, violence, and the constant threat of family separation. They were denied basic freedoms like the right to marry, own property, or to learn to read and write, and were frequently subject to physical and sexual abuse. Despite the brutal conditions, enslaved peoples resisted their enslavement in various ways, from subtle acts of defiance to organized rebellions. The abolitionist movement, which sought to end slavery, gained momentum in the 19th century, culminating in the Civil War and the eventual abolition of slavery in 1865. But slavery was integral to the southern economy, providing a cheap labor source that made large-scale plantation agriculture highly profitable. The wealth generated from slave labor significantly contributed to the economic development of the United States. After the end of the Civil War and the passage of the 13th Amendment, Sharecropping replaced slavery as the primary system of agricultural labor in the southern United States. Under sharecropping, a landowner would provide a sharecropper with land, housing, tools, seed, and other supplies in exchange for a share, usually half, of the crop harvested at the end of the season. The sharecropper would then use their portion of the crop to pay off the debts incurred for the supplies, often leaving them with little or no profit. All told, about a million and a half people worked as sharecroppers, about one-third of all southern farmers, with the vast majority of them being African American. This system perpetuated a cycle of poverty and debt. Landowners often manipulated the system to their advantage, charging high rates of interest for supplies and underpaying sharecroppers for their crops. This kept sharecroppers in a perpetual state of debt, making it difficult for them to accumulate wealth or escape the system. It also had obvious racial overtones. 
landowners who were predominantly white held significant power over sharecroppers who were mostly black. This power dynamic reinforced existing racial hierarchies and limited economic opportunities for African Americans. Furthermore, discriminatory laws and practices, such as the Black Codes and Jim Crow laws, further restricted the rights and freedoms of African Americans, making it difficult to break free from the cycle of poverty. It trapped them in a system of economic dependency and limited their social mobility. While it initially provided a way for newly freed slaves to work the land and support their families, it ultimately became a tool for maintaining white supremacy and perpetuating racial inequality. A variety of factors contributed to the decline of the sharecropping system. The Great Depression devastated the agriculture sector, leading to falling crop prices and widespread poverty. This drove many sharecroppers to abandon their farms and to move north in search of better jobs and living conditions as part of the Great Migration. The New Deal and World War II also created new work opportunities, as mechanization of farming reduced the need for manual labor, making sharecropping less economically necessary for landowners. In 1942, the U.S. government established the Bracero Program, officially known as the Mexican Farm Labor Program, to permit farm laborers from Mexico, called Braceros, to work temporarily in the United States. The program was established to address the severe shortage of labor faced by the United States during World War II. Over its 22-year existence, the program was in effect from 1942 until 1964, the Bracero program facilitated the employment of an estimated 4.6 million Mexican laborers in the United States. Many returned multiple times under different contracts, making it one of the largest guest worker programs in U.S. history. The Bracero program was terminated for several reasons, growing concerns about the exploitation and mistreatment of Braceros fueled by the civil rights movement led to increased scrutiny and criticism of the program. The program was marred by widespread exploitation and abuse of the Braceros as many workers face substandard housing, discrimination, and wage theft, a legacy that affects U.S.-Mexico relations to this day. The program was also opposed by labor unions in the United States, who argued that it depressed wages and undermined working conditions for domestic U.S. workers. The broader political climate in the United States also shifted towards restricting immigration and promoting domestic labor, ultimately spelling the end of the program. The current state of farm labor in the United States reflects this long history. Despite the formal termination of the Bracero program in 1964, the vast majority of farm workers in the United States, about 73% of them, were born outside the United States, with the vast majority coming from Mexico and smaller numbers coming from Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and elsewhere. According to the U.S. Department of Labor, roughly half of all farm workers are undocumented, lacking legal authorization to work in the United States. The majority of farm workers, about three-quarters, are male and relatively young, with a median age in the early 40s. However, women are also a vital part of the workforce, often engaging in harvesting and packing tasks. Many farm workers have low levels of formal education, with the NAWS reporting that the average level of education is around an eighth grade level. A significant portion also speak little or no English. The demographic profile of the average farm worker makes them particularly vulnerable to low wages and poor working conditions that characterize the work. Farm labor is characterized by long hours, often exceeding 10 hours a day during peak season, and physically demanding tasks performed under challenging conditions like extreme heat or cold. Farm workers typically earn low wages. The U.S. Department of Labor reported that the average hourly wage for farm workers was $14.62 in 2020, which is below the national average for all workers. However, there was a difference in wages between documented and undocumented workers, with the former making on average about 2 to $3 more per hour than the latter. Documented workers are also more likely to have access to better job security and protections than their undocumented counterparts. It's also important to note that many farm workers are paid on a piece rate basis, meaning they're compensated based on the amount of produce they harvest rather than a set hourly wage. This can lead to significant variations in income, with some workers earning more than the average wage and others earning less, depending upon their productivity and the type of crop being harvested. Many farm workers lack access to basic benefits like health insurance, paid sick leave, or retirement plans. Housing conditions are often substandard, with many workers living in overcrowded and unsafe accommodations. 
Farm workers also face numerous health risks, including exposure to pesticides, heat stress, musculoskeletal injuries, and limited access to health care. Finally, it's estimated that hundreds of thousands of children work in U.S. agriculture, often under hazardous conditions that can affect their health, education, and overall well-being. U.S. labor laws allow children as young as 12 to work in agriculture with parental consent, and there are fewer restrictions on working hours compared to other industries. Children under 12 can work on small farms with their parents' permission. Agricultural work can interfere with schooling, leading to lower educational attainment and limited future opportunities for the children involved. Farm workers in the United States are covered by a patchwork of federal and state laws, each with varying degrees of protection and enforcement. The Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 established minimum wages, overtime pay, child labor standards, and other laws that govern employment in the United States even through today. But a variety of exemptions are carved out for on-farm employment. While the federal minimum wage generally applies to farm workers, there are exceptions for small farms. Farm workers are exempted from the Act's overtime pay provisions, and the Act permits children as young as 12 to work in agriculture with parental consent and with fewer restrictions compared to other industries. The Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Workers Protection Act of 1983 was the first federal legislative effort to address working conditions faced explicitly by farm laborers. The act requires employers to disclose terms of employment, maintain wage and hour records, pay wages when due, and ensure housing and transportation safety. It also extends federal minimum wage protections to agricultural workers, but does not require overtime pay or protect the right of migrant workers to organize. The Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 established OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which sets and enforces standards to ensure safe and healthy working conditions. In the context of farming, OSHA regulations require employers provide drinking water, hand washing facilities, and toilet facilities for workers in the fields. It also sets standards for safe handling and application of pesticides, though enforcement can be limited. Finally, a variety of state-level laws also provide protection for farm workers, though these laws vary in scope and effectiveness across the states. California, for example, has the most expansive protections. The California Agricultural Labor Relations Act was passed in 1975 to protect the right of farm workers in the state to organize, join labor unions, and collectively bargain with employers. It prohibits unfair labor practices, ensures secret ballot elections for union representatives, and establishes the Agricultural Labor Relations Board to enforce the law. This law is credited as the primary reason why farm workers' wages in California are among the highest in the country. California has also implemented specific regulations to protect workers from heat illness, requiring employers to provide water, shade, rest breaks, and training on heat illness prevention but proposals to extend these kinds of protections have largely stalled at the federal level. The protections afforded farm workers in California are largely the result of the political struggle led by Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, and the National Farm Workers Association, the NFWA, in the 1960s and 70s. The NFWA faced significant obstacles, including opposition from powerful agricultural interests, legal barriers, and the difficulty of organizing a transient and dispersed workforce. Drawing inspiration from the African-American struggle for civil rights, it employed a strategy of nonviolent resistance as a core principle of the struggle, organizing strikes, boycotts, and marches to draw attention to the working conditions faced by farm laborers. The NFWA focused on grassroots organizing, building a strong sense of community among farm workers, and providing legal aid, credit unions, educational programs, and other services to their members. In September 1965, the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, composed primarily of Filipino-American farm workers, initiated a hunger strike against grape growers in Delano, California, demanding higher wages and better working conditions. Led by Chavez and Huerta, the NFWA joined the strike shortly after its start, marking a pivotal moment in the farm labor movement. The strike gained national attention, particularly through the use of a nationwide boycott of table grapes. The boycott appealed to customers' sense of justice, urging them to stop buying grapes until the workers' demands were met. It also garnered support from various sectors, including civil rights organizations, religious groups, students, and labor unions, with prominent figures like Robert F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. voicing their support for the farm workers' cause. 
After five years of struggle, the UFW achieved a major victory in 1970 when grape growers agreed to sign labor contracts, marking the first time that farm workers had successfully negotiated collective bargaining agreements with agricultural employers. The persistent efforts of the UFW also led to the passage of the Agricultural Labor Relations Act, which granted farm workers in California the right to unionize and bargain collectively. The success of the UFW inspired other labor movements and brought national attention to the plight of farm workers and influenced subsequent labor policies and reforms aimed at improving the conditions of agricultural workers. The struggle of the National Farm Workers Association has been picked up by several contemporary groups. The Fair Food Program, led by the Coalition of Imalaki Workers, the CIW, has created a partnership with major food retailers to ensure fair wages and safe working conditions for farm workers. The Fight for $15 in Agriculture is campaigning to raise the minimum wage in the farm sector to $15 an hour. It's part of the broader Fight for 15 campaign, a nationwide campaign to increase the minimum wage in all sectors across the economy. But one of the major criticisms of the local food movement has been its consumer-centered focus and its prioritization of environmental issues to the exclusion of labor standards and social justice. And yet, our contemporary food system is heavily dependent on farm workers. While grain crops and oilseed, crops like rice, barley, and canola, are highly mechanized, permitting modern machinery like combines and harvesters to mechanize most farm operations and permit growing with minimal manual intervention, Others are far more dependent on farm labor. Fruits and vegetables are among the most labor-intensive crops, often requiring manual planting, harvesting, sorting, and packing due to their delicate nature. For crops like strawberries, apples, tomatoes, lettuce, and grapes, farm labor is essential. Indeed, it's estimated that 50 to 70 percent of the production of fruits and vegetables relies on manual labor. Many specialty crops, like nuts, berries, and herbs, also require significant manual labor for harvesting and processing. Harvesting almonds and pistachios, for example, often involves manual shaking and collecting, while berries, like blueberries and raspberries, are typically picked by hand to avoid damage. Similar to fruits and vegetables, specialty crops have a high reliance on manual labor, potentially ranging from 60 to 80 percent of activity depending upon the specific crop and region. Overall, according to the USDA, hired labor accounts for about 13% of total input costs in agriculture on average, but this number is much higher for specialty crops like fruits and vegetables, where it can exceed more than one-third of total costs. This highlights the essential role that farm workers play in feeding the nation and underscores the importance of ensuring fair wages and working conditions for these workers. But that's it for now. Please leave any questions you have in the comments section below, and as always, thanks for watching. Bye.